Greeting City of Albuquerque contractors and employees. Uh, we are excited to open a new building and obviously during COVID it's very different and we're doing it virtually. But uh, no, actually this is a big deal. It's very rare actually that the city opens a brand new facility. And so it's usually met with much fanfare and celebration. And so we want to try and remember what that's like and maybe we'll do this again in the summer. But uh, congrats to folks who put together the Albuquerque Support Service Center uh, and Annex. This is actually a really important piece of what we're trying to do, which is two things. One, keep services out in the community as opposed to all consolidated downtown at City Hall, but also uh, try and provide workspace for folks, both city employees and contractors, who kind of fit together in terms of their actual programmatic work. And so this is a great example of where we're able to consolidate you know, folks from both our violence intervention program, some of our behavioral health contractors, and some of our other homeless outreach each folks. It's going to be a really nice team, I think, in there. And uh, it is uh, obviously, too, you know, it's your, you've got a good view of Coronado Park, which I mean can, can cut both ways. There's great trees, uh, but it's also, you know, a reminder of the challenges facing our city. But it's a statement that we're not giving up on Wells Park or on anyone in our community. We are continuing to invest both your resources for being out there and, of course, physically as a city, uh, saying that we move in where, in many places, other people are trying to move out and we move in to help. So thank you for being a part of that and I hope to see you out at the Annex soon. Hi, my name is Quinn Donne and I work for Family and Community Services at the City of Albuquerque. Behind me is the former Bischoff Law Firm building that the city has recently purchased and renovated to house some of our current city programs and agencies that we contract with. Let's go take a look inside to see what updates we've made. One of the city's programs that will be housed in this building is our public outreach team who primarily works with Albuquerque's unhoused citizens to help them get connected to services if needed. Here we are on the first floor of the City of Albuquerque Community Support Annex and I wanted to show you our conference room that really shows the history of this building. You'll see here floor to ceiling, law books, volumes upon volumes. These books were everywhere in this building. They are not now. However, we did want to show the history by keeping them here in this conference room. So let's take a look on the second floor to see some of our providers. So here we are on the second floor of the City of Albuquerque Community Support Annex. This part of the building will be featuring our violence intervention program that's through APD and it looks a little bare, but they're anxiously awaiting furniture and whatnot for folks to be able to wait for their appointments. So the violence intervention program started in about March of uh, 2020, so it's very, very new. And prior to that, the city, the mayor, and um, it took teams of people actually to other sites in the nation, three other sites in the nation, who have implemented similar programs in order to understand the program, understand the challenges of implementation, and understand the successes that can be had in reducing gun violence from the programs. Custom notifications consists of a team of about three to four people that is both law enforcement and community members. And they go out together. The law enforcement actually goes out in plain clothes as, and this is a, a visit to say, we number one, we care about you. We don't want to see you in, involved in any other shootings. We don't want to see you go to jail any time in your life. Don't retaliate. What can we do to help you? You or your family. Um, how can we start the process of healing? To my surprise, the message is very well received. At the beginning, when I first went out, I was skeptical because uh, I go out with a commander from APD. And to my surprise, it, it's very shocking to them that a, 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 a commander from Albuquerque Police Department tells them, you know what, we care about you. We don't want to see you dead. We don't want to see you in prison. And I'll stare at them and I'll look at their reactions. And a lot of the times they're like, wait a minute, what? And so that breaks down, you know, it breaks down their guards and then they'll start listening to the message and he pretty much 
tees them up for me and then once he introduces me they're very receptive especially because like as you can tell I'm heavily tattooed so that they'll look at me and I'll tell them a little bit about my life story and how I got here and uh, it's been very well received being in this space here is wonderful because now I have an actual address where I can tell people look this is where I am come look for me if you lose your phone this is where I am come come talk to me here um, it also feels because I was having a problem with follow-through I set intakes up for people and it'd be up to them to call or not a lot of them weren't calling so now I have an actual space where I could go pick them up sit them in my office give them the phone here call do your intake and then um, I could pick them up take them directly to the to the place and a lot of the times people are looking for friendship or that camaraderie that relationship now I have a place where they could just come in and talk to me here you know if that's what they need so let's take a look over here at some of our public artworks that have been installed and these are not the only ones the city's 1% for Art program is one of the oldest in the country. It's been around for 42 years. We're pleased that this facility showcases 13 monoprints created by New Mexico Pueblo artists at the Tamarind Institute as a special collaboration with the Public Art program in 1996. They've all been recently rematted and reframed and we're enjoying the bright colors and special imagery by indigenous artists. Additionally, the foyer is graced with a very recent donation of a unique suspended weaving by Albuquerque artist Evelyn Ann Selvicius, donated by Ann Taylor of UNM. And here on the second floor, this space is being prepared for our community partner, Centro Savila, who will be moving in in the next couple of weeks. Centro Savila is an outpatient behavioral health and social services organization, and we have clinicians, case managers, and advocates that are working uh, to help folks that have been living out at the West Side Emergency Housing Center, the WEHC, and uh, with people in, in underserved areas of the city. A lot of our model at Centro Savila is about meeting people where they're at, and we have health care and social service deserts in this community, the same way they talk about food deserts, places where it's hard to access services. And meeting people out at the West Side Emergency Housing Center, um, where you're 20 miles out of town, and oftentimes the times that we could meet with them were when the clinic was open during the evening. So if they needed case management needs met, it's hard to get on the phone and talk with an office because they were all closed. And so being here, we're very close to where they get dropped off and where they get picked up to go back out to the West Side Shelter um, is, is really critical because it reduces the barriers that they have transportationally. And those are huge barriers for folks that are um, either on the street or living in the shelter. The city of Albuquerque has done a lot of cosmetic upgrades to this building to lighten it up and really modernize it, including lighten the paint, create new flooring, and also there's no more wood paneling, and that also creates a nice, lovely, light feel here. So we are very excited for folks to start coming to this building and services to be provided to the most in need people in our community. Uh, my name is Carol Pierce. I'm the Director of Family and Community Services here at the City of Albuquerque. And we're just so delighted that you would spend your Friday evening with us at least a little while to see this new treasure in our community. It's actually an old treasure, but we're, we're very excited to have it be part of the City of Albuquerque and really excited to share that video with you this evening. And, and actually give you the chance to meet a few of our people that are in that building and to, to meet them um, firsthand. So with that, I would like you to know if you have questions, um, we've got a chat box and our public information officer, Bobby Cisneros is monitoring that chat box and you could ask a question and we'll answer a few questions um, that may be on your mind this evening. 
But with that, um, we've got a few panelists here, as I mentioned, people that are um, there currently housed in the city of Albuquerque support annex. And so, um, Quinn, I think I'll turn it to you to introduce our panelists tonight. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Thanks so much, Carol. And thanks everybody for coming tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, as I go ahead and announce you, Panelists, please go ahead and unmute yourself and unmute your camera as well so everybody can see your face. So first I'd like to introduce Selena Lopez. She is with our Public Outreach Department. And then I will also introduce Sebastian Adamczyk, who is also with our Public Outreach Department. And then we have Bill Wagner, who is with Centro Savila and Angel Garcia, who is with our Violence Intervention Program. Hello everyone, thanks so much for coming. So before we open up the Q&A to just any sort of question, I did want to, I did want our uh, viewers tonight to get to know you a little bit more. So what I'd like to do is ask you the question, what inspires you to do this work? So what I'd like to do is just turn, I'm gonna ask each of you individually and you can have two to three minutes to answer that or less, no, you know, or less, uh, just so you can, you know, paint the picture to us and help everyone understand what brings you here. So let's see, Selena, I'd love to start with you. What inspires you to do the work of public outreach? Hello, so um, Selena Lopez with uh, Family and Community Services. Uh, I've been with the city of Albuquerque for over 23 years. And uh, actually I started with Family and Community Services for quite a while. Uh, ended up in doing some crisis outreach with APD as a civilian. And then just recently this year, went back to Family and Community Services and it's almost like it's just home. And I think when I first got started with the city and uh, actually all my life is just wanting to be part of that and how can I help? Um, yeah, just, just being out there, uh, provide services, uh, reach out to people, get a rapport going. Um, and just those, I think those that are really in need that aren't heard, that don't have a voice, um, it has always been, I think, maybe a calling just to, that I feel to, to help out. Thanks so much, Selena. And uh, let's see here. I'm curious. I'm just going to go ahead and be open uh, as we're figuring out some of our tech support. I just received a text message from a person viewing, wondering if we could see every all of the members of the panel at the same time. So uh, tech support, I was hoping if you could make sure some of those, all those videos show up at the same time, uh, that would be fantastic, or at least as people are speaking. So thanks so much. So I'd like to turn that same question over to Sebastian Adamczyk, who's also with our public outreach department. So Sebastian, what inspires you to work for public outreach? Well, lots of things. Um, I think in particular, um, seeing success stories, um, which in the realm of helping people get housed, um, sometimes that's not as readily apparent and it takes a long time to get there. But actually um, about a week ago, I ran into a lady that we worked with for almost a year um, in a variety of different ways. We encountered her in many different encampment areas. Um, but over that year, we got to know her pretty well. Uh, we knew her story. We saw, unfortunately, we saw her health deteriorate. We saw her behavioral health deteriorate in that time. But every time we encountered her, we pose the same kind of standard questions and, and standard supports that we do to many folks. You know, we ask them what their needs are. We ask them what their uh, goals are and what we can do to help support that. And one time we encountered this woman, um, she had just gotten out of the hospital and uh, she had just had enough. She didn't want to live on the streets anymore. She wanted to focus all of her energies in getting, you know, housed and getting off the streets. And at that moment, we capitalized on that. And I made every phone call I could. 
I tried to grease as many wheels as I could, and we were unfortunately hit with a lot of barriers. Um, after about a week or two, we had uh, gotten in touch with a lot of people. She had been a high need on a list, and we had to update some demographics for her and some of her recent circumstances. Um, but I actually just ran into her last Monday. Uh, she was visiting a friend at Coronado Park. And last Monday was the day that she was going to sign the lease on her new apartment. Mm. And it's things like that that I think are, are really the most valuable reason why I do this kind of work. Um, in our role with the city, we have to navigate a lot of different systems. We have to balance the needs um, you know, across departments. Of course, we work with many collaborative partners, which is very helpful to be in the building that we are now housed in. Um, it, to be able to have those relationships with people. Because ultimately, that's, that's what actually gets stuff done, is developing those relationships with people and making the right connections happen at the right time. And, and yeah. Thanks so much, Sebastian. I really appreciate that input. And, you know, what I hear from you and Selena at, from Public Outreach is that you two are masters at connection, at creating those bridges into where people need it. And really going back, find, connecting again. You don't just leave the folks out there. So that's a really great representation of uh, outreach for our city. And thank you so much. And now I'm going to turn over to Bill Wagner with Centro Savila. Bill, what inspires you? Oh, wow. Um, you know, so many things about this project really inspire me. Um, I'm, I'm a clinical social worker, and so I've been working as a therapist and a case manager for uh, longer than I want to say, 25 plus years. But I, um, you know, when I moved to Albuquerque in 97, I um, realized that I was one of the few bilingual therapists here in town. And um, you know, that led eventually to starting a nonprofit um, that was really geared towards helping people that have very big barriers and getting access to health care, um, whether they're geographic, linguistic, whether they have access to health insurance. And so it's always been sort of my passion to look at these blind spots in our community. And um, what I mean by that is that um, where there's, there's areas that aren't getting covered by the services that we need. And that impacts everyone. Of course, it impacts the people that most need the services, but it impacts our whole community. And we want to have a healthy community. Um, this is my community. My, my kids go to school in Wells Park. I, um, I, I, I love this community and um, I want to see everyone uh, healthy and well, and um, their wellness impacts my wellness. One of the most inspiring things about this project is that we started Centro Savila, which by the way, Savila is the aloe vera plant. And um, the reason we chose that image for our organization is that it's a plant that connotes a lot of wellness. And it also um, is a plant that when is uprooted still can live. And a lot of the people that we work with have been uprooted in one way or another. And we want to know that, that they can find roots and that Albuquerque can be their home and, and that they have a safe place. And so, um, you know, when we started working out at the West Side Shelter, um, we saw a lot of people that didn't have that, um, families and children, and, um, and we wanted to make sure that we, we could do that. But we know that as a small grassroots organization, we can't do it alone. And what's been inspiring about this project is that you have the city, the county, um, even the state in some situations right now, housing many people, working to, to find solutions in this very difficult time that we're in. And so I just, I love the collaboration. I love the spirit, the core of the group. And um, I, I, I love the, the fact that there is um, change happening. Um, many people are finding services and like you've heard already from Sebastian, people are getting housed and that's what we want to see, not just temporary solutions. We want some permanent solutions from this. And, and, um, 
And I have a team of folks that are peers, uh, meaning that any of them have experienced the kind of situations that um, their, their clients are living and um, their lived experience is as valuable as a, a degree from any university. So we want um, that experience um, to be put to use and, um, and investing in the human capital of our, of our community. And, and, and this offers us, as I mentioned in the video, a place that is just perfectly located to do that. And hopefully we'll start seeing some changes. So just, just happy to be part of this group. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bill. Uh, I really appreciate what you said today. And you know, what I hear from you is 1997, you saw a gap and you pounced. And you know, with you and your agency, I see compassion in the community and really wanting to help people meet their needs when they're not meeting them. So thanks so much for that. Um, and I did want to just keep encouraging the attendees. If you have any questions, please continue to put them in the chat box. We will be referencing those in just a few moments. So thanks so much. And now I'd like to turn over to Angel Garcia, who works with our violence intervention program. And I'd love to ask you that same exact question, Angel. What inspires you to do this work? I, I don't have to go or reach deep within myself to find the inspiration. Um, I'm a returned citizen and it was not that long ago where I was in the same shoes as the people that I'm, I'm trying to help. So the inspiration comes from the anger, the loneliness when you're sitting in prison, the pain, the suffering, the hurt. Um, the hopelessness, the feeling that no one cares, all that drives me, <clears throat> apologize, all that drives me today to show them that, yes, we do care. You're in the community. You are part of this community. We care. So my program concentrates, as is in the title, strictly on gun violence. We're trying to reduce the gun violence. So the people that I talk to have uh, have either already been victimized or were arrested with a gun or anything to do with guns. So the, in turn, my job is to go and try to offer them a way out of that lifestyle. And um, I understand the obstacles and the challenges that it takes when one is trying to change their life, you know? So um, like I said in the video earlier, having that space there where they could come hang out with me and just uh, they could come chat with me. It, it, it's awesome. And I actually had a client and this was very rewarding for me. I actually had a client tell me, had you guys not came, have you guys not came to knock on my door? I was waiting for my wounds to heal and I was going to go retaliate. So I, needless to say, I, I text and I interact with that individual every day because I don't need him slipping through my fingers but it, it, it was very rewarding for me. And, and it was a funny situation because when we went knocking on his house, the commander from APD was talking to him and he cut him off and he told him, uh, excuse me, I just have to ask this guy, how are you involved in all of this? If you're all tattooed like I am, I, you know, it was kind of funny. So that was the first connection that me and that person had. And, um, you know, I, uh, I work with him now, uh, he had an infection on his back that we, we just taken care of. And now we're moving on into enrolling him at CNM. He wants to do something sort of like what I'm doing. So human services, here we come. Thank you, Angel. That's very compelling. Uh, you use your, your lived experience to motivate you, to incite passion in others, and to help. I feel like I, what I'm hearing from you is you help others feel seen help them feel heard and understood in their own struggle. And that is invaluable in a program like this. So thank you so much for, uh, for speaking, speaking to that. Well, now it looks like it's time to answer some questions. So I'm wondering, uh, Bobby, if there's anything coming up that uh, 
for these agencies or programs that we could answer? Sure. The first question comes from Joe Sabatini. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Joe. And he's wanting to know when will the building be open for serving clients? Well, that's a great question. Right now, uh, I believe the violence intervention program is seeing clients now. Angel, is that correct? Yes. Um, so I, I, I tell my clients that they could come see me there. Uh, but uh, for right now, it's just myself seeing my clients there. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, and we're, you know, because of COVID, there is limitations to how many people are in the building and Centro Savila is still in the, uh, in the, <laughs> sorry, furniture. my words, furniture they're box. moving in. Yes, they're you moving know, in. So. Can, I, can I just say one thing about, um, yeah, yes. we, we plan to be in there as soon as we can get a, a, a desk and a, a, you know, a couch where people can sit down. But I, I want to say I really, really appreciate the attention that the city gave to making this a beautiful space. I, you know, as a social worker, I've worked in closets. I've worked in rooms that um, I get depressed in and uh, it's hard for me to help other people when, uh, you know, when I'm not feeling well. So it's, it's, it's just very important that this is a welcoming and beautiful space that gives people the dignity that they deserve. And I'm, I'm really proud of the city for thinking about that because a lot of people don't. They're just like, okay, we've got a space. This is a beautiful space and we're gonna make it a dignified space for people to come in and, and get served. And we hope to do that before the end of this year. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I did also just see a question come through asking what are the working hours of this facility and any chances to expand hours into the evening? Mm -hmm. um, right now, the hours are when people are there doing, doing the work they need to and then they leave. There isn't uh, specific hours of operation. However, I anticipate that once uh, Centro Savila moves in that the hours will look a little different. And I'm also curious, uh, Bill, do you provide services into the evening? Or would you provide services into the evening? Yeah, when we were um, working out at the West Side Shelter, we did. Um, we want to be very um, considerate of, of the clients and the community about the hours that we keep there. And what we, you know, what we will need to do is, is work it around when people can be there. What we know and why this is such a unique place to work is that people are dropped off as early as six in the morning and then they get picked up. You know, most people are, are, that are going out to the West Side Shelter are, are leaving by six or I think seven at the latest. And so, you know, we want to make ourselves available when, when people need those services. And um, that includes weekends. And so... Um, but we, we don't expect that it's going to create any new flow of people to the community. We expect that it will um, hopefully get some of the folks that, that um, don't have anywhere to go, places to live, um, support, because that's what our peers are doing. Our peers are, are navigating the complex systems that if you don't have a car, you don't have a phone, you don't have a laptop, it's really hard to do. And so um, we're gonna be helping them with people that are experiencing getting those needs met. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll see some change. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I also have a question here from Anne Marie for Angel. Uh, do you help people who are convicted of gun crimes find jobs? It seems like it would be difficult for them to find to find jobs? Uh, yes, so I have a contact person at Workforce Solutions that I met when I was at CNM, and I've uh, kind of fostered and uh, taken care of that contact. So I do have a, 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 a direct person that I can refer people to. And um, I, I usually suggest that they try that, that new uh, JTA program, job training, uh, that's a con in conjunction with CNM. They train them for a specific industry and then they help them get placed in that industry. But, uh, but yes, uh, 
uh, part of my work at CNM, I also helped start a resource center for students with criminal records. So for my work back then, I also had a lot of contacts of people who were willing to hire felons. Uh, me being a felon myself, that was of interest to me the whole time when I moved from Los Angeles to Albuquerque. Long story short, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Angel. Um, and I also have a couple questions here regarding housing for public outreach. So Selena and Sebastian, you are on deck. So there, I'm just going to ask these both together. So one is from Nanette. And the question is, what is your program average turnaround time for applicants who apply and act to, for applicants who apply to actually receiving housing? And then there's also a follow up for when you find a housing for people, how often do you follow up with them? So take it away, outreach. Sure. So this is Sebastian Adamczyk with the Public Outreach Program again. Um, so our program does not provide direct housing. We provide the connection to service providers in the community who do. So a lot of our role, um, of course, we're responding to encampments. Our role is to identify what services people are already accessing, um, if any, um, to make sure that they're following up with those services if they are accessing any. And if they're not accessing services, um, to do like a mini needs assessment and make sure that they're making those connections happen. And so a lot of our role is really playing the long-term game with folks because what I've seen housing, I've seen it vary from anywhere from immediate uh, with certain veteran populations to taking several years for folks and everywhere in between. And it really depends on the person and their circumstances. Um, in Albuquerque and echoed through the state of New Mexico, there is something that they, the New Mexico Coalition and Homelessness has created um, with a bunch of partner agencies that helps to prioritize people. So typically in the system, those who have the highest level of social needs um, and the, those can vary like if they're physically disabled or they have some profound mental illness to, you know, their experience of violence on the streets or things like that, the higher their acuity for those social needs, the higher their priority on those lists. Um, and so it just really depends on a person's unique circumstances. And really our goal is mainly to make sure those connections are happening and that they're continuing to happen. And so like one example, you know, when we encounter somebody, let's just assume that they have not encountered a, a single outreach provider or program in the, in the Albuquerque area. And so we'll tell them typically what's closest to them. So if they're camping, you know, up in the foothills area or in the Southeast area command or Southeast area of Albuquerque, or down in the valley, there are organizations that are, you know, kind of strategically placed and we'll get them connected to the closest one is typically our, our safe bet. And then we'll advise them what services they provide. Um, we'll tell them about the different uh, lists that they can sign up on. And then we do follow up. And in some instances, we can also do coordinated assessments, which helps them get to that coalition uh, supported priority list. We can do those in the field. Um, and then whenever we re-encounter people, we typically follow up. And sometimes um, with uh, our relationship with the coalition and various service providers, we help remake connections that have lost or kind of fatigued over time. So if they're looking for somebody who's short on the housing list, meaning they're close, and if they can't find them, they'll ask us. And then if we've encountered them recently or we know generally where they're at, we'll go identify that person and make sure, you know, if it's holding the phone next to their ear while they talk to them or make sure that they're getting in touch with the right people at the right time. Um, that's really what we do is we make those connections happen uh, across those agencies. And I apologize. I went on that whole kind of soapbox and I forgot the second question. <laughs> If I could, I'm going to go ahead and add here, um, Sebastian, thank you so much. I think you and Selena are such connectors in the community. You are our people with boots on the ground, really making sure people are safe, asking them if they need resource and often knowing where somebody might be so they could get connected. You know, one of the things we hear a lot from our, our 
fellow, our providers, those community organizations that are doing the housing, Hope Works, Heading Home, Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless, is sometimes they will get them on that list. They do an assessment and they get them on the list that Sebastian described. But then they've got to find the person. So that sometimes that is challenging. And I think I'm going to segue to another question that was asked and it relates to the wellness hotel. So our group right on this call, we're not directly connecting people right over to the wellness hotel, but we are connecting people to the providers who are. So healthcare for the homeless, heading home, Catholic charities, um, we've got a big list there. And one of the benefits of the wellness hotel, so we're just delighted that some of the viewers tonight are familiar that we've set up this system of people who are vulnerable, who don't have homes, that we want to make sure they're safe from the spread of COVID. And so we've now opened up three hotels, also in partnership with the county. And so older people, usually 60 years of age and older, who have chronic conditions are in those hotels. And we are, we're really setting up a very robust system to get them connected to the right housing um, that makes sense for them through our partners. But it's making it, I don't know if, if it's easier, but I'll say we know folks are there in that wellness hotel. And so they're getting directly connected to their case manager. And the question about SOAR, many of those providers do have um, that SOAR certification that we know is really important. Um, so I, we're excited about this safety net system that I guess I'd call it the silver lining of COVID. We all have to find some of those silver linings. And this is one of them. And so we're grateful for our outreach team, but we're equally grateful for our community partners like, like Central Savila and all those that I'm naming that are out there doing the important work of housing. You know, so Quinn, if I may, I'm going to take that baton. I, I know one of the questions that was asked was about encampments. And I'm going to answer part of that and then hand it back over to Selena and Sebastian. So um, public encampments aren't um, allowed, whether it's on private property. And we, the city, can't go in and take somebody off of private property because it's private. And But public property... This is where we have a responsibility to meet with people, make sure they're safe, not being in harm's way when they're close to roads and that kind of thing. And we have a very specific process to get people connected. And so I do want to hand it to Seb Sebastian and Selena, who do this work daily to give people notice, to reach out, and um, to get them connected. So, Sebastian? Sure, I'll take it away, Karen. So um, really our work focuses on three main components. Um, the primary one we've talked about at great length, which is outreach. Um, our goal there is to identify people's needs, get them connected to supportive services in the community, um, to work on their path towards housing. We also, we kind of have to wear two hats in this scenario. We're also the individuals who are responding to encampments to conduct enforcement, um, which is unfortunately one of the negative components of our job. But the reason why we do both is because we can make those connections happen for folks and we can work on the actual long term goal of them finding appropriate housing that meets their needs. And then lastly, we do um, also coordinate with other city agencies once an encampment has been cleared out to conduct the cleanup of the area. But primarily with in when it comes to encampments, uh, Carol, you're correct. There are no encampments allowed on, on city-owned public property. And private property, typically code enforcement, um, they have a role in enforcing on that. We do provide outreach support to those code enforcement personnel um, when they do encounter encampments on private property. But we do have a, a process when it comes to vacating and clearing an encampment. And it a lot of it depends on the level of risk um, associated to the individuals. Unfortunately, a lot of folks do camp in areas that are what we would consider to be high risk, meaning that there's an imminent safety risk to that person or persons there. Uh, for example, um, we've had encampments um, in the medians of freeways. That's not necessarily the best place for someone to be. 
Um, and in those scenarios, that would be um, a scenario where we would vacate the camp encampment immediately, meaning that we would identify the individual, we would talk to them about, you know, different outreach provide or different out correction, different resources available to them um, and make those connections happen while they're clearing their encampments. Um, other areas where it's not so high risk, we do have a process that varies. Um, meaning that the, the high risk ones are typically shorter duration. The less risky ones, we typically push out to a several day notice, um, meaning that we will talk to an individual, we'll tell them about all the resources that they're eligible for, um, try to make those connections happen. We'll tell them, okay, you know, you can't camp in this particular area you have until such and such date uh, to vacate, after which, you know, cleanup will occur. Um, and so typically we'll encounter those encampments over many, many days, um, which also helps us to build some rapport with an individual um, because we are navigating those two sides of the coin there. Um, sometimes some interactions don't go so well, but if you get to know people over time, they'll see that you're actually there to provide some assistance and, and make those connections happen. And that's really where our goal is focused in on. Yeah, I so much appreciate, Sebastian, that um, about building relationships. It is about mm -hmm. building connections with people, meeting them where they're at, what we can do mm -hmm. to get folks connected. I was wondering, Selena, with all your experience as well, anything you would add to Sebastian's comprehensive answer? Uh, he stated it very well. Um, but one of the things... Um, I think networking with not only our community providers, um, you know, getting to know them, um, what they do um, makes it really a, a lot easier for us. So like when we're out there getting, trying to get to know what the people's needs are, you know, people out in the community, what are your really, what are the needs? Sometimes they're hesitant at first. They don't, um, you know, want to talk, but if we keep on and keep on and build that rapport and that relationship, um, then they start breaking down some, you know, uh, some, I don't know, they're just some, I, I don't know the word, but it just, we start breaking it down and they feel a little bit more comfortable. And then they start telling us what their needs are. And if we can get asked the right questions and then tell us what the needs are, knowing which provider provides all that, those services, um, that makes it a lot easier. So um, been doing this for a long time. And I think that is such a key component is just getting to know their um, what and what Sebastian said, just time and, and just talking to people, building that relationship. And when it's that right moment and they're ready, knowing those agencies that, you know, that that can help out on that particular need. Yeah, no, thank you. I'd Celine. like to chime in for a quick second, Carol. We have a question in the Q and a from David Dixon. Oh. <laughs> He's fine. He says, I agree this building is a great addition. Thinking about wraparound services, how complete are the services that ABQ, that City of Albuquerque and Bernalillo County can provide? What an addition is needed? Wow, well, that's a great question. Um, you know, what, what we're doing here at the Support Annex is a, a piece of a, a larger, more comprehensive system for sure. It's a larger piece of the puzzle. Here, the wellness hotels came up and th that's a piece right now of the system as well as our partners. I can tell you, um, you know, there it, there is a huge need for behavioral health services in our community. And I think I I'd like Bill to speak um, about that. I know it, it comes up all the time. We've got pieces, but we can use more. So Bill, do you want to talk a little bit more about that gap? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, <laughs> are you okay? Yeah. Or the need for I have a three-year-old. Uh, um, so um, let me let me just back up. When when I started going out to the West Side Shelter, I um, you know I was meeting with people on a regular basis about. Uh, hold on one second. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> do what you have to do. I think we're okay. Um, so the, um, you know, the, the thing that I saw was that, yes, there's been a, if, if you've been living on the street or if you've been living in a shelter, you've probably had a lot of loss. You've probably had 
some trauma in your life. Um, you may be struggling with a mental illness. We saw a lot of other things, substance use disorders, people struggling with substance use, people struggling with brain injuries, um, and sometimes all three. And so, um, you know, we have people that have clinical training in brain injury. We have people that are training in dealing with substance use. We have people trained in dealing with mental health needs. And um, it is, it's, it's critical for us to find a safe place to do that. Um, you know, for those of you who have been out at the West Side Shelter, you're, you'll know that it used to be our Metropolitan Detention Center. It was, it was a jail. And so having a beautiful, safe place like this in community, I think, creates the environment for providing these services. Having, um, you know, our partners located there provides the opportunity for warm handoffs. And when somebody, you know, who is working on the case management end says, hey, I think there's some other things that are going on here. Can we help? It's just a very quick link. And that's always been a problem because, you know, if, if you need to see a specialist out at the West Side Shelter for, for mental health issues or for substance use, a, a slip of paper to somebody out there doesn't mean much, you know. Um, it, means, it means a trip that they can't make and a wait that they can't make. And so this is all about bringing services to the community instead of centralizing services in one place. And, and the, the goal is that a lot more of this will happen um, in our community and this will make a difference. It'll make, uh, make services more accessible. Mental health has been historically underfunded. Um, we, we, we need more and more services for this. And, and I think the pandemic is, is, is bringing that to the surface because of people's own experiences with depression, with isolation, and how that has a huge impact on your health. And so, um, you know, I'm very hopeful that this is just the beginning of, of more people and coming to, to provide these services and more resources for those people that are doing it. Um, Central Savila, one of the things that we do is we're a pipeline program. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an example of the problem in New Mexico is that um, I was recruited from out of state to come here to provide services. We don't need to do that. We have um, universities uh, that are teaching our, our, our own community here. And I consider this my community. <laughs> um, so we, we are bringing up students and interns and we can multiply our effect as providers by having more students come in, more students see how meaningful this work is and helping others. Um, and and I, 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 I see just from my own experience and, and I, just briefly on this, I don't wanna go too far down this road, but you know, behavioral health and our safety net in New Mexico was under attack. And in 2013, it was dismantled for the poor. So we are in a period where that is not the mentality. And hopefully we'll never go back to those dark days where, where the, the, the systems that are supposed to support behavioral health and, and mental health, you know, the support of our, our families and their emotional and psychological well-being that will never happen again. And, and as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's, that's um, you know, over my dead body. Um, and I think a lot of people here believe that as well, that we are going to make sure that these services continue to grow and that they are badly needed and um, that they're available to everyone, not just small bubbles of people that can afford it. And if, if I can go to the other end of the spectrum, I don't know. It, it, about housing. So we talk about some of our needs and our gaps. You know, right now they're um, coming up with rental apartments as we're working to getting people housed. Sometimes there can not be enough or there are barriers. If people have criminal history or sometimes a, a, a deposit is a barrier or you need renter's insurance. And so um, that is one of the needs in our community. We've begun to work with some landlords to say, can you give us locations of apartments all over town because people have jobs 
all over town, not just one part of town. And we've really tried to break down some of those barriers to say, just because somebody has a criminal history, please don't put up a barrier. Housing is is a basic need as we're really trying to get people um, to, ha- to be um, have the best life they can or to access the services they can or to, to access their job. And so that on the other end of the spectrum, that's something that that is needed, that, that we're working on, that we appreciate some of those landlords working with us to break down some of those barriers that do exist. And I, I also want to really acknowledge um, that we've got, and I'm really sorry if I might not pronounce her name correctly. Um, we've got one of the, the people doing intake at the wellness hotels from the international district. Um, we're delighted that she's on, I can't quite scroll fast enough to find her name, but we're really delighted that, that she's here. Um, Bobby, maybe you can help me. Um, I believe it's pronounced Geromina. I apologize if I messed that up, but she also has a a question. She wants to know what solutions can we come up with for the unsheltered individuals that are seniors that have chronic conditions with sex offender background. And I was actually just trying to Google that. And unfortunately my internet is not running so fast. Um, This is something that has come up quite a few times recently Mm -hmm. is people with um, backgrounds as a sex offender. And interestingly enough, we just had uh, on Thursday, yesterday, um, a, uh, uh, we were attended an echo session where one of the speakers was actually um, somebody who worked with the county who was in charge of the sex offender registration program. Now, I know a couple of things from that are true. Um, housing options kind of vary, interestingly enough, depending on when they were registered as a sex offender because there are different laws that apply at different times that specify different sets of rules. Um, And so with that one, I think actually I would have to spend a significant amount of time doing a little bit of research or deferring to one of our community partners who is uh, uh, basically an expert or a guru, if you will, in in finding those resources. And I would have to defer that question because I can't Google it fast enough. Um, but I'd love if you put your contact information in the chat box and I will get an answer for you um, and we can collaborate that way because likely there's some details that I would need for, from that individual um, that probably shouldn't be shared as well on a, on a Zoom. We've got a few minutes left, so let's see if we can ask this question from Felipa Jax. Um, do you provide interpretation and translation services? If so, what languages? Well, I myself, I'm fluent in Spanish and English, but other than that, um, no. I mean, we could reach out to somebody if need be. Yeah, we there's I, always I a resource. In, I can chime in real quickly and let everyone know that we do work with our Office of Equity, Equity and Inclusion. <laughs> Sorry about that. And we reach out to them in those cases when we need trans, uh, translators or interpreters. Um, and we have, a, correct me if I'm wrong, Carol, but I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 different languages uh, that we can uh, provide some, some form of translation for. Access, yes. And it, that's right, Bobby. And as we get up to speed here at our new support annex, folks will have um, phone numbers to access. If somebody spoke Swahili or Vietnamese, then our, our staff could have access to those translation lines. And that's what we do at our health and social service centers if we have that need. I did want to make sure we also answered one question. I appreciate Bobby got an eyeball on the time. Um, the, ans- the question was about COVID testing at this facility. So a lot of the folks that are receiving services and will receive, they've made a prior appointment. I just want, they've, they've called up Angel or Angel, when can I see you? Or with, with Bill and his team. In terms of COVID testing, this it won't be at this facility. Now we do offer COVID testing at our West Side 
facility, as well as we work with our community partner, Street Outreach with Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless and First Nations for people to get COVID testing. So, um, but this facility um, will certainly in, in these times that we're in be following all the COVID safe practices that, that we need to in terms of mask wearing and distance when we are meeting with folks, but no testing will be provided at, at this facility. And Carol, if I could interject really quickly, um, uh, something I just discovered um, not terribly long ago, um, pretty soon some street outreach or some street medicine teams uh, should be able to do some COVID testing, at uh, least rapid testing in yes. the field, uh, yes. which historically has not been able to do, but that is coming soon. Yeah, that's right. So Bobby, is there anything else we should quickly answer before I wrap it up? I have a few things I just wanna say. There, there was a question there, somebody was asking how the community can help with this new building. And I always wanna provide opportunity for folks that are interested in helping. So is there any way the community can help? With, with my program, um, I had typed an answer to you, Nanette. No. Uh, with my program, the violence intervention program, it needs community buy-in, so we need a lot of help from the community. So I will be reaching out to you. Uh, we don't have enough time to discuss it here, but uh, you will hear from me. Great. And I appreciate Mr. Dixon. He's given us um, information about La Posada housing. I'm writing it down right now. Yeah, so great. Um, gosh, I feel like we could spend the evening together. This, I'm just so grateful for our team and for this many members of the community would spend an evening with us. I, I'm just so proud. I'm proud that we were able to secure and have this beautiful building that's been part of our community for so long. I appreciate your comments, Bill. We wanted to make it um, the best it can be. I appreciate Quinn's help learning all about colors and how to get connected with the 1% art program. And I'm really proud of the history that we've got the, the building in there that has the books. I'm reminded, I think I want to reach out to the, the former owners so they realize that we're really remembering that history. And just, I think it's really a proud piece for the Wells Park area. I'm just excited that, that we could um, preserve that building. And I'm just excited about what our, our team is doing to respond to community need. And so with that, I just want to say thank you for joining with us tonight. I also, um, Bobby, if you could help me just add our family and community services number in the chat box. That's also a number that you can reach a lot of us and we can get you connected to the person that you might like to speak with. So thank you so much. I really appreciate the fact that you would join us this evening and to celebrate this exciting moment for our community. Have a good evening.